All About Love, Chapter 10, Romance, Sweet Love, and the introductory quote. Sweet love, say, where, how, and when, what do you want of me? Yours I am, for you I was born. What do you want of me? St. Teresa of Avila. Here we go. To return to love, to get the love we always wanted but never had, to have the love we want but are not prepared to give, we seek romantic relationships. We believe these relationships, more than any other, will rescue and redeem us. True love does have the power to re redeem, but only if we are ready for redemption. Love saves us, saves us only if we want to be saved. For many seekers after love are taught in childhood to feel unworthy, that nobody could love them as they really are, and they construct a false self. In adult life, they meet people who fall in love with their false self. But this love does not last. At some point, glimpses of the real self emerge and disappointment comes. Rejected by their chosen love, the message received in childhood is confirmed. Nobody could love them as they really are. Few of us enter romantic relationships able to receive love. We fall into romantic attachments doomed to replay familiar family dramas. Usually we do not know this will happen precisely because we have grown up in a culture that has told us that no matter what we experienced in childhoods, no matter the pain, sorrow, alienation, emptiness, no matter the extent of our dehumanization, romantic love will be ours. We believe we will meet the girl of our dreams. We believe someday our prince will come. They show up just as we imagined they would. We want the lover to appear, but most of us were not really clear about what we wanted to do with them, what the love was that we wanted to make and how we would make it. We were not ready to open our hearts fully. In her first book, the Bluest Eye, novelist Toni Morrison identifies the idea of romantic love as one of the most destructive ideas in the history of human thought. Its destructiveness resides in the notion that we come to love with no will and no capacity to choose. This illusion, perpetuated by so much romantic love, stands in the way of our learning how to love. To sustain our fantasy, we substitute romance for love. When romance is depicted as a project, or so the mass media, especially movies, would have us believe. Women are the architects and the planners. Everyone likes to imagine that women are romantics, sentimental about love, that men follow where women lead. Even in non-heterosexual relationships, the paradigms of leader and follower often prevail, with one person assuming the role deemed feminine and another the designated masculine role. No doubt it was someone playing the role of leader who conjured up the notion that we fall in love that we lack choice and decision when choosing a partner because when the chemistry is present, when the click is there, it just happens, it overwhelms, it takes control. This way of thinking about love seems to be especially useful for men who are socialized via patriarchal, patriarchal notions of masculinity to be out of touch with what they feel. In the essay, Love and Need, Thomas Merton contends, the expression to fall in love reflects a peculiar attitude toward love and life itself a mixture of fear, awe, fascination, and confusion. It implies suspicion, doubt, hesitation in the presence of something unavoidable, yet not fully reliable. If you do not know what you feel, then it is difficult to choose love. It is better to fall. Then you do not have to be responsible for your actions. <laughs> Even though psychoanalysts from Fromm writing in the 50s to Peck in the present day critique the idea that we fall in love, we continue to invest in the fantasy of effortless union. We continue to believe we are swept away, caught up in the rapture, that we lack choice and will. In The Art of Loving, Fromm repeatedly talks about love as an action, essentially an act of will. He writes, to love somebody is not just a strong feeling. It is a decision. It is a judgment. It is a promise. If love were only a feeling, there would be no basis for the promise to love each other forever. A feeling comes and it may go. Peck builds upon Fromm's definition when he describes love as the will to nurtures, nurture one's own or another's spiritual growth, adding, the desire to love is not itself love. Love is as love does. Love is an act of will, namely both an intention and an action. Will also implies choice. We do not have to love. We choose to love. Despite these brilliant insights and the wise counsel they offer, most people remain reluctant to embrace the idea that it is more genuine, more real, to think of choosing to love rather than falling in love. 
Describing our, roman our romantic longings in Life Preservers, therapist Harriet Lerner shares that most people want a partner who is mature and intelligent, loyal and trustworthy, loving and attentive, sensitive and open, kind and nurturant, competent and responsible. No matter the intensity of this desire, she concludes, few of us evaluate a prospective partner with the same objectivity and clarity that we might use to select a household appliance or a car. To be capable of critically evaluating, evaluating a partner, we would need to be able to stand back and look critically at ourselves, at our needs, desires, and longings. It was difficult for me to really take out a piece of paper and evaluate myself to see if I was able to give the love I wanted to receive and even more difficult to make a list of the qualities I wanted to find in a mate. I listed 10 items. And then when I applied the list to men I had chosen as potential partners, it was painful to face the discrepancy between what I wanted and what I had chosen to accept. We fear that evaluating our needs and then carefully choosing partners will reveal that there is no one for us to love. Most of us prefer to have a partner who is lacking than no partner at all. What becomes apparent is that we may be more interested in finding a partner than in knowing love. Time and time again, when I talk to individuals about approaching love with will and intentionality, I hear the fear expressed that this will bring an end to romance. This is simply not so. Approaching romantic love from a foundation of care, knowledge, and respect actually intensifies romance. By taking the time to communicate with a potential mate, we are no longer trapped by the fear and anxiety underlying romantic interactions that take place without discussion or the sharing of intent and desire. I talked with a woman friend who stated that she had always been extremely fearful of sexual encounters, even when she knew someone well and desired them. Her fear was rooted in the shame she felt about the body, sentiments she had learned in childhood. Previously, her encounters with men had only intensified that shame. Usually, men made light of her anxiety. I suggested she might try meeting with the new man in her life over lunch, with the sad agenda of talking to him about sexual pleasure, their likes and dislikes, their hopes and fears. She reported back that the lunch was incredibly erotic. It laid the groundwork for them to be at ease with each other sexually when they finally reached that stage in their relationship. Ah. Erotic attraction often serves as the catalyst for an intimate connection between two people, but it is not a sign of love. Exciting, pleasurable sex can take place between two people who do not even know each other. Yet the vast majority of males in our society are convinced that their erotic longing, longing indicates who they should and can love. Led by their penis, seduced by erotic desire, they often end up in relationships with partners with whom they share no common interests or values. The pressure on men in a patriarchal society to per perform sexually is so great that men are often so gratified to be with someone with whom they find sexual pleasure that they ignore everything else. They cover up these mistakes by working too much or finding playmates they like outside their committed marriage or partnership. It usually takes them a long time to name the loveliness, lovelessness they may feel. And this recognition usually has to be covered up to protect the sexist insistence that men never admit failure. Women rarely choose men solely on the basis of erotic connection. While most females acknowledge the importance of sexual pleasure, they recognize that it is not the only ingredient needed to build strong relationships. And let's face it, the sexism of stereotyping women as the caregivers makes it acceptable for women to articulate emotional needs. So females are socialized to be more concerned about emotional connection. Women who have only named their erotic hunger in the wake of the permission given by the feminist movement and sexual liberation have always been able to speak their hunger for love. This does not mean that we find the love we long for. Like males, we often settle for lovelessness because we are attracted to other aspects of a partner's makeup. Shared sexual passion can be a sustaining and binding force in a troubled relationship, but it is not the proving ground for love. This is one of the great sadnesses of life. Too often, women and some men have their most intense erotic pleasures with partners who wound themselves in other ways. The intensity of sexual intimacy does not serve as a catalyst for respect, care, trust, understanding, and commitment. Couples who rarely or never have sex can know lifelong love. Sexual pleasure enhances the bonds of love, but they can exist and satisfy when sexual desire is absent. Ultimately, most of us would choose a great love over sustained sexual passion if we had to. Luckily, we do not have to make this choice because we usually have satisfying erotic pleasure with our loved one. 
The best sex and the most satisfying sex are not the same. I have had great sex with men who were intimate terrorists, men who seduce and attract by giving you just what your heart, what you feel your heart needs, then gradually or abruptly withholding it once they have gained your trust. And I have been deeply sexually fulfilled in bonds with loving partners who have had less skill and know-how. Because of sex sexist socialization, women tend to put sexual satisfaction on its appropriate in its appropriate perspective. We acknowledge its value without allowing it to become the absolute measure of intimate connection. Enlightened women want fulfilling erotic encounters as much as men, but we ultimately prefer erotic satisfaction within a context where there is loving, intimate connection. If men were socialized to desire love as much as they are taught to desire sex, we would see a cultural revolution. As it stands, most men tend to be more concerned about sexual performance and sexual satisfaction than whether they are capable of giving and receiving love. Even though sex matters, most of us are no more able to articulate sexual needs and longings than we are able to speak our desire for love. Ironically, the presence of life-threatening sexually transmitted diseases has become the reason more couples communicate with each other about erotic behavior. The very people, many of them men, who had heretofore claimed that too much talk made things less romantic find that talk does not threaten pleasure at all, it merely changes its nature. Where once knowing nothing was the basis for excitement and erotic intensity, knowing more is now the basis. Lots of people who feared a loss of romantic and or erotic intensity made this radical change in their thinking and were surprised to find that their previous assumptions that talk killed romance were wrong. Cultural acceptance of this change knows that we are all capable of shifting our paradigms, the foundational ways of thinking and doing things that become habitual. We are all capable of changing our attitudes about falling in love. We can acknowledge the click we feel when we meet someone new as just that, a mysterious sense of connection that may or may not have anything to do with love. However, it could or could not be the primal connection while simultaneously acknowledging that it will lead us to love. How different things might be if, rather than saying, I think I'm in love, we were saying, I've connected with someone in a way that makes me feel I'm on the way to knowing love. I've connected with someone in a way that makes me think I'm on the way to knowing love. Or if instead of saying, I am in love, we said, I am loving or I will love. Our patterns around a romantic love are unlikely to change if we do not change our language. We are all uncomfortable with the conventional expressions we use to talk about romantic love. All of us feel that these expressions and the thinking behind them are one of the reasons we entered relationships that did not work. In re retrospect, we see that to a grave extent, the way we talk about these bonds foreshadowed what happened in the relationship. I certainly changed the way I talk and think about love in response to the emotional lack I felt within myself and in my relationships. Starting with clear definitions of love, of feeling, intention, and will, I no longer enter relationships with the lack of awareness that leads me to make all bonds the site for repeating patterns, old patterns. Although I have experienced many disappointments in my quest to love and be loved, I still believe in trans the transformative power of love. Disappointment has not led me to close my heart. However, the more I talk with people around me, I find disappointment to be widespread, and it does lead many folks to feel profoundly cynical about love. A lot of people simply think we make too much of love. Our culture may make much of love as compelling fantasy or myth, but it does not take make much of the art of loving our disappointment about love is directed at romantic love we fail at romantic love when we have not learned the art of loving it's as simple as that often we confuse perfect passion with perfect love a perfect passion happens when we meet someone who appears to have everything we wanted to find in a partner i say appears because the intensity of our connection usually blinds us we see that we what we wanted to see. In Soulmates, Thomas More contends that the enchantment of romantic illusion has its place and that the soul thrives on ephemeral fantasies. While perfect passion provides us with its own particular pleasure and danger, for those of us seeking perfect love, it can only ever be a preliminary stage in the process. We can only move from perfect passion to perfect love when the illusions pass and we are able to use the energy and intensity generated by intense overwhelming erotic bonding to heighten self-discovery. Perfect passions usually end when we awaken from our enchantment and find only that we have been carried away from ourselves. 
It becomes perfect love when our passion gives us the courage to face reality, to embrace our true selves. Acknowledging this meaningful link between perfect passion and perfect love from the onset of a relationship can be the necessary inspiration that empowers us to choose love. When we love by an intention and will, by showing care, respect, knowledge, and responsibility, our love satisfies. Individuals who want to believe that there is no fulfillment in love, that true love does not exist, cling to these assumptions because this despair is actually easier to face than the reality that love is a real fact of life but is absent from their lives. In the last two years, I have talked a lot about love. My topic has been true love. It all started when I began to dis to speak my heart's desire, to say to friends, lecture audiences, folks sitting next to me on buses and planes and in restaurants that I was looking for true love. Cynically, almost all my listeners would let me know that I was looking for a myth. The few who still believe in true love offer their deep conviction that you can't look for it, that if it's meant for you, it will just happen. Not only do I believe wholeheartedly that love exists, I embrace the idea that its occurrence is a mystery, that it happens without any effort of human will. And if that's the case, then it will happen whether we look for it or not. But we do not choose, lose love by looking for it. Indeed, those among us who have been hurt, disappointed, disillusioned, must open our heart if we want love to enter. The act of opening is a way of seeking love. I have had a taste of true love. That experience intensifies my longing and my desire to search. A true love in my life first appeared to me in a dream. I had been invited to a conference on film and was reluctant to attend. I hate being bombarded by lots of new ideas at one time. It feels to me like overeating. Yet I had a dream in which I was told that if I went to this conference, I would meet a man of my dreams. Images in the dream were so vivid and real that I awakened with a sense of necessity. I called a girlfriend and told her my story. She agreed to go to the conference with me as my witness. A few weeks later, we arrived at the conference in the middle of a session in which speakers were on stage. I pointed to the man whose image had appeared in my dream. After the session, I met him and we talked. Meeting him was like seeing a long lost relative or friend. We went to dinner. There was a feeling of mutual recognition between us from the start. It was as though we knew each other. As our conversation progressed, he told me he was in a committed relationship. I was puzzled and disturbed. I could not believe divine forces in the universe would lead me to this man of my dreams when there was no real possibility of fully realizing those dreams. Of course, those dreams were all about being in a romantic relationship. That was the beginning of a difficult lesson in true love. I learned that we may meet a true love and that our lives may be transformed by such an encounter, even when it does not lead to sexual pleasure, committed bonding, or even sustained contact. The myth of true love, that fairy tale version of two souls who meet, join, and live happily ever thereafter, is the stuff of childhood fantasy. Yet many of us, female and male, carry these fantasies into adulthood and are unable to cope with the reality of what it means either to have an intense life altering connection that will not lead to an ongoing relationship or to be in a relationship. True love does not always lead to happily ever after, and even when it does, sustaining love still takes work. All relationships have up and down, ups and downs. Romantic re fantasy often nurtures the belief that difficulties and downtimes are an indication of a lack of love rather than part of the process. In actuality, true love thrives on the difficulties. The foundation of such love is the assumption that we want to grow and expand, to become more fully ourselves. There is no change that does not bring with it a feeling of challenge and loss. When we experience true love, it may feel as though our lives are in danger. We may feel threatened. True love from... True love is different from the love that is rooted in basic care, goodwill, and just plain old everyday attraction. We are all continually attracted to folks. We like their style, the way they think, the way they look, etc. Whom we know that, given a chance, we could love in a heartbeat. In his insightful book, Love and Awakening, A Love and Awakening, Discovering the Sacred, sacred Path of Intimate Relationship, John Wellwood makes a useful distinction between this type of attraction, familiar to us all, which he calls a heart connection, and another type he calls a soul connection. Here's how he defines it. A soul connection is a resonance between two people who respond to the essential beauty of, another, of each other's individual natures behind their facades and who connect on a deeper level. This kind of mutual recognition provides the catalyst for a potent alchemy. alchemy. It is a sacred alliance whose purpose is to help both partners discover and realize their deepest potentials. While a heart 
connection lets us appreciate those we love just as they are. A soul connection opens up a further dimension, seeing and loving them for who they could be and for who we could become under their influence. Making a heart connection with someone is usually not a difficult process. Throughout our lives, we meet lots of people with whom we feel that special click that could take us on the path of love. But this click is not the same as a soul connection. Often a deeper bonding with another person, a heart connect, a soul connection, often a deeper bonding with another person, a soul connection happens whether we will it to be or be so or not. Indeed, sometimes we are drawn towards someone without knowing why, even when we do not desire contact. Several couples I talked with who have found true love enjoyed telling me the story of how one of them did not find the other at all appealing at first meeting, even though they felt mysteriously joined to that individual. In all cases where individuals felt that they had known true love, everyone testified that the bonding was not simple or easy. To many folks, this seems confusing precisely because our fantasy of true love is that it will be just that, simple and easy. Usually we imagine that, bless you. Usually we imagine that true love will be intensely pleasurable and romantic, full of love and light. In truth, true love is all about work. The poet Rainier Maria Rilke wisely observed like so much else people who people have also misunderstood the place of love in life they have made it into play and pleasure because they thought that play and pleasure was more blissful than work but there is nothing happier than work and love just because it is the extreme happiness can be nothing else but work the essence of true love is mutual recognition two individuals seeing each other as they really are we all know that the usual approach to is to meet someone we like and put our best self forward or even at times a false self, one we believe will be more appealing to the person we want to attract. When our real self appears in its entirety, when the good behavior becomes too much to maintain or the masks are taken away, disappointment comes. All too often individuals feel after the fact when feelings are hurt and hearts are broken, that it was a case of mistaken identity, that the loved one is a stranger. We saw what they wanted to see rather than what they really were, that, than, rather than what was really there. True love is a different story. When it happens, individuals usually feel in touch with each other's core identity. Embarking on such a relationship is frightening precisely because we feel there is no place to hide. We are known. All the ecstasy that we feel emerges as this love nurtures us and challenges us to grow and transform. Describing true love, Eric Butterworth writes, true love is a peculiar, peculiar kind of insight through which we see the wholeness which the person is, at the same time totally accepting the level on which he now expresses himself, without any delusion that the potential is a present reality. True love accepts the person who now is without qualifications, but with a sincere and unwavering commitment to help him to achieve his goals of self-unfoldment, which we may see better than he does. Most of the time, we think that love means just accepting the other person as they are, who among us has not learned the hard way that we cannot change someone, mold them, and make them into the ideal beloved we might want them to be? Yet when we commit to true love, we are committed to being changed, to being acted upon by the beloved in a way that enables us to be more fully self-actualized. This commitment to change is chosen. It happens by mutual agreement. Again and again in conversations, the most common vision of true love I have heard shared was one that declared it to be unconditional. True love is unconditional, but to truly flourish, it requires an ongoing commitment to construct constructive struggle and change. The heartbeat of true love is the willingness to reflect on one's actions and to process and communicate this reflection with the loved one. As Wellwood puts it, two beings who have a soul connection want to engage in a full, free-ranging dialogue and commune with each other as deeply as possible. Honesty and openness is always the foundation of insightful dialogue. Most of us have not been raised in homes where we have seen two deeply loving grown folks talking together. We do not see this on television or at the movies. And how can any of us communicate with men who have been told all their lives that they should not express what they feel? Men who want to love and do not know how must first come to voice, must learn to let their hearts speak, and then to speak truth. Choosing to be fully honest to reveal ourselves is risky. The experience of true love gives us the, the, gives us the courage to risk. As long as we are afraid to risk, we cannot know love. Hence the truism, love is letting go of fear. Our hearts connect with lots of folks in a lifetime, but most of us will go to our graves with no experience of true love.
This is in no way tragic, as most of us run the other way when true love comes near. Since true love sheds light on those aspects of ourselves, we may wish to deny or hide, enabling us to see ourselves clearly and without shame. It is not surprising that so many individuals who say they want to know love turn away when such love beckons. No matter how often we turn our minds and hearts away, or how stubbornly we refuse to believe in its magic, true love exists. Everyone wants it, even those who claim to have given up hope. But not everyone is ready. True love appears only when our hearts are ready. A few years ago, I was sick and had one of those cancer scares where the doctor tells you if the tests are positive, you will not have long to live. Hearing his words, I lay there thinking, I could not possibly die because I am not ready. I had not found true, I had not known true love. Right then I committed myself to opening my heart. I was ready to receive such love and it came. This relationship did not last forever and that was difficult to face. All the romantic lore of our culture has told us when we find true love with a partner, it will continue. Yet this partnership lasts only if both partners, if both parties remain committed to being loving. Not everyone can bear the weight of true love. Wounded hearts turn away from love because they do not want to do the work of healing necessary to sustain and nurture love. Many men, especially, often turn away from true love and choose relationships in which they can be emotionally withholding when they feel like it but still receive love from someone else. Ultimately, they choose power over love. To know and keep true love, we have to be willing to surrender the will to power. When one knows a true love, the transformative force of that love lasts even when we no longer have the company of the person with whom we experience profound mutual care and growth. Thomas Merton writes, we discover our true selves in love. Many of us are not ready to accept and embrace our true selves, particularly when living with integrity alienates us from our familiar worlds. Often, when we undergo a process of self-recovery, for a time we may find ourselves more alone. Writing about choosing solitude over company that does not nurture one's soul, Maya Angelou reminds us that it is never lonesome in Babylon. Fears of facing true love may actually lead some individuals to remain in situations of lack and unfulfillment. There they are not alone. They are not at risk. To love fully and deeply puts us at risk. When we love, we are changed utterly. Merton asserts, love affects more than our thinking and our behavior toward those we love. It transforms our entire life. Genuine love is a personal revolution. Love takes your ideas, your desires, and your actions and welds them together in one experience and one living reality, which is a new you. We often are in flight with the new you. Richard Bach's autobiography, Richard Bach's autobiography, Richard Bach's autobiographical love story, Illusions, describes both his flight from love and his return. To return to love, he had to be willing to sacrifice and surrender, to let go of the fantasy of being someone with no sustained emotional needs to acknowledge his need to love and be loved. We sacrifice our old selves in order to be changed by love, and we surrender to the power of the new self. Love within the context of romantic bonding offers us the unique chance to be transformed in a welcoming celebratory atmosphere. Without falling in love, we can recognize that moment of mysterious connection between our soul and that of another person as love's attempt to call us back to our true selves. Intensely connecting with another soul, we are made bold and courageous. Using that fearless Using that fearless will to bond and connect as a catalyst for choosing and committing ourselves to love, we are able to love truly and deeply, to give and receive a love that lasts, a love that is stronger than death. And that's that. On that, I'll see you in the next one. Love you guys.